Welcome fifth graders to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. And we'd like to give a special welcome to a number of schools this afternoon. Uh, we have Johnson McQueen Elementary from Longview ISD with us today. Indian Creek Elementary from Southwest ISD um, in the San Antonio area with us today. John Ireland Elementary from right here in the Dallas Independent School District. Baird Elementary from Crosby ISD. Marcellus Elementary, Connor Elementary, and the Solar Preparatory School for Girls all from the Dallas Independent School District with us this afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, registering ahead of time for this field trip. We wish you could be here in person, but we're going to do our best to make you feel like you're here um, through a virtual field trip uh, today. If you are watching this and have not registered yet for this field trip, you can do that by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register. And you'll fill out a short form to get yourself or your class registered for this field trip. We just use that information for our attendance purposes. Now today's uh, field trip is going to be about forms of energy. During this virtual field trip, students will discover that energy occurs in many forms and can be observed in cycles, patterns, and systems. Students will also explore the uses of energy and observe that the flow of electricity in closed circuits can produce light, heat, or sound. So we're going to start off this afternoon by exploring mechanical energy. Next, we're going to explore thermal energy. Next, we will explore light and sound energy. And last, we will explore electric circuits. While we're doing all of that, you can ask us questions. Uh, the way you ask a question is by going to a website, which is www.tiny.cc slash EEC dash question dash answer. And there you'll fill out a very short form um, to ask us any question you have related to forms of energy. You can ask us as many questions as you have, and we will do our best to answer all of them in the time that we have with you this afternoon. So let's get started with that trip. We're going to start off with mechanical energy with Ms. Ramirez. Hi, I'm not Ms. Ramirez. I'm Mrs. Fuller, but I am happy to talk to you about energy today. The energy that we're going to talk about in this segment is mechanical energy. Now, you might say, what's energy? And the answer is energy is the ability to do work or to move things. Mechanical energy is the energy an object or a material has because of its motion or because of its position. Mechanical energy is the sum of po potential energy, which is stored energy, and kinetic energy, which is energy in motion. Now, this last part's real important. All living things and all machines use mechanical energy to do work. Now we're going to just um, do so, use some toys here to demonstrate mechanical energy. You need to remember a little mnemonic device. It's please kick me, and that's P K M, potential kinetic mechanical. So when you add the potential energy to the kinetic energy, the energy of motion, you get mechanical energy. So we're going to start right off the bat with a little inclined plane, a ramp. Okay, let me move him down so you can see him. We have a little ant on a skateboard, looks like a leaf, and we're going to put him up here at the top of the ramp. This, whoopsie, this part up here where he's hanging out, this part is the potential part. He's not moving, but he has the potential. He actually is moving. He has the potential for moving. When I release him with my finger, gravity's going to pull him down the inclined plane. It's going to pull him down the ramp. That part where he's in motion is the kinetic part. Potential, kinetic. You add those two together, you get mechanical. All right. So let's look at something else. So we've got the, the potential energy of position. The ant was high. Let's talk about another kind of uh, potential energy, stored energy, like what you would see uh, in a rubber band or the tension for, from a spring. So let's start off with, we've got a little monster here who's on a spring. Can you see that spring? I'm going to compress that spring. And when the spring, when it's compressed, that's the potential part. When the spring leaps into uh, action, that's the kinetic part. So we're going to have 
potential. And in just a second, we're going to have the, the kinetic, the, the energy of motion. That one turned out pretty good, don't you think? All right, let's see what else we've got here. Here's another uh, potential uh, of tension. It's one of those great big clips that you put over a whole bunch of paper. It's got a lot of tension. I'm going to have to take my hand to open it. As my hand opens it, what happens? It moves. Mechanical energy. Okay, here's another one. How many of you have ever taken a pair of scissors and cut the rubber band off that's around a, a bunch of flowers or around a newspaper? And when you cut it, the newspaper, um, not the newspaper, the rubber band went flying across the room. Well, we've got a little toy here. You're going to love this. Chicken flingers. You heard of chicken fingers? So this is chicken flingers. And it's, uh, it's that same thing, except it's more fun. And you put your finger inside the head of the chicken, and its body is real stretchy, just like a rubber band. This part where you've got the tension inside the body, that's the potential energy. When I let go of his feet, he goes flying across the room. That was the kinetic part. Remember, potential plus kinetic equals mechanical. Let's do it one more time because it's fun. Potential, kinetic, mechanical energy. All right, let's see what else we have here. We have a great little toy here. This little caterpillar has a spring inside of it. We're going to put tension on the spring. He has a key on the side of his body. I'm going to turn the key and put a lot of tension inside the body of this toy so that that part will be the potential part. When I set him down, he's going to start moving. That's going to be the kinetic part. Now, he doesn't move fast like that chicken, and he doesn't move fast like the monster that jumped up and down, but he's moving. So that's the mechanical part. Kinetic, wound the key. No, excuse me. Potential with the key. We had we had the wound up spring. Then when we released it, he started moving. That was the kinetic part. P K M. Potential kinetic mechanical. All right. Let's get another guy right here. Okay. Here's a top. This uh, this top is going to be spun by a muscle in well several muscles in my hand when I eat food. That food provides the energy for my body and is stored in the cells of my body. When I need to move something, when I need to do work, I call on that chemical potential energy to, to do the work. So we already know I ate breakfast, the, the energy is in the cells. Now it's that was the potential part. Now I'm going to spin the top. I didn't do a very good job. It tipped. This is a really good top. It'll it'll spin for a long time, but um, it's going out of sight. Sorry. We'll move back so you can see it. Um, so potential plus kinetic. Kinetics the uh, energy of motion equals mechanical. All right. Now we've got one more that we're going to show you. This is a, a top. Oh, no, I've got two more. Let me do the other one. I'll do the top last. Okay, here's another simple machine, a wedge. Two wedges together, which forms what? Yeah, a pair of scissors. So I'm going to cut. So right now is the what, what, what part? Potential. That was the kinetic part, the, uh, the, inner, the, the type of energy of motion, kinetic energy. Okay, now we're back to the top. Here we go. Have a simple, another simple machine. Have a screw. Uh, right now it's potential. When I push the screw into the toy, it's going to turn cogs. It's going to turn the machine. And it's also going to make a sound, sound energy. So also, and it's going to change the colors at the top. You keep your eye on that. Isn't that great? So we had potential, then we had kinetic, 
mechanical energy. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Mrs. Fuller. On um, the question that came in was, how does mechanical energy work with simple machines? So I'm going to share my screen here with you real quick to show uh, some pictures that illustrate that. So there we have an inclined plane. And an inclined plane by itself isn't doing anything. But if you push a box up an inclined plane, now that movement is mechanical energy. And here is a wedge, uh, which could be like a pair of scissors or a knife or an ax. And a wedge by itself doesn't do anything, but if you attach that uh, uh, wedge to a handle and swing it, um, that mechanical energy will be able to allow you to split wood using um, the wedge. And then here's a lever. Uh, there's different kinds of levers. So this lever doesn't look exactly like this lever does, but the hammer is another example of a lever. Scissors are an example of a lever. Even a wheelbarrow is an example of a lever. So anytime you got that movement of pulling a nail out of a piece of wood or going up and down in a seesaw, that is mechanical energy. And then we have a wheel and axle. So once those wheels start turning in a doorknob or wheels on a car or wheels on your bicycle, that is mechanical energy working with a wheel and axle. And then we have a screw. If I take a pair of, uh, or not a pair of pliers, but a, um, a screwdriver, and screw that screw into a wall. That turning most motion is uh, mechanical energy, or if you screw a lid on a jar, that's another type of screw, and that, that's mechanical energy that when it goes around and around until it's tight. And then the last simple machine is a pulley. So if I pull down on this rope, the bucket goes up, and that is mechanical energy working with the simple machine. Another example is the flagpole at your school. If you pull one rope down, the flag goes up, and that is a pulley allowing you to do that. And that again, that motion is mechanical energy. All right, now we're gonna get into thermal energy with Ms. Ramirez. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're gonna be learning about thermal energy. Thermal energy is just the total kinetic energy of particles within a substance. So the faster the particles are moving, so the more kinetic energy, then the more thermal energy a substance has. So you learned earlier that kinetic energy is just energy in motion. So essentially thermal energy is energy that comes from heat that is generated by the rapid movement of particles. Now let's take a look at heat. Heat is the transfer of energy. So it's describing the movement of energy. And generally heat will move from things that are warmer to things that are cooler. And we can use a thermometer as a science tool to measure temperature. Now the scientific definition of temperature is it's the measurement of the average kinetic energy of particles in a substance. And here's an example of our thermometer and I'm gonna demonstrate how our thermometer works. So inside the thermometer, there is a red liquid. When that red liquid gets heated, um, the kinetic energy will increase of those particles and it will cause that liquid to expand or rise. So that's why when it's hot outside, we'll see that red liquid in the higher numbers. When it starts to cool down, like for example today, um, that liquid will shrink or contract and it'll be further down on our thermometer. Now I have a science tool called a hand boiler to demonstrate how a thermometer works. So inside the hand boiler, there's a similar a uh, liquid and our body uh, produces body heat. So I'm gonna hopefully use my warm body heat to cause the liquid to rise. And because I've been super cold lately in this room, um, I tried opening a packet of these hand warmers to see if I can warm my hand up. Uh, so this is a good example of converting chemical energy into heat energy. So I'm gonna see if I can warm my hands up just enough to cause this liquid to rise. So I'm just gonna gently cup it and you can see how the liquid is rising. So I'm increasing that thermal energy and it's causing the liquid to expand. Now, eventually if I remove my hand and let this sit back at room temperature, the liquid will eventually cool down and it will contract or shrink back down the tube. So that's our hand boiler and that demonstrates um, how our thermometer works. Now we were talking a lot about thermal energy and how thermal energy is related to kinetic energy or movement. So let's take a look at this little jar of particles. So we know that all matter is made out of particles. And when we increase um, movement, then we increase thermal energy. So for example, 
let's compare the thermal energies of different scenarios. So let's look at this. So these particles are barely moving when I shake the glass like this. So this has very little kinetic energy and very little thermal energy. Now, what happens if I shake it a little bit more like this? You notice that the particles start to move around a little bit more. So we have more kinetic energy and therefore more thermal energy. Now, what happens if I shake it really fast? So you can see the particles are moving a lot faster. So we have more kinetic energy and also more thermal energy. Now let's take a look at how that impacts our states of matter. Let's look at these two popsicles. So I have a frozen popsicle and a room temperature popsicle. Which one do you think has more thermal energy? Which one do you think has more kinetic energy? So let's take a look at our frozen one first. The frozen popsicle, the particles that make up this frozen popsicle, they are slow moving particles. So they have lower kinetic energy and therefore lower thermal energy. And that is why we have a solid. So the particles are kind of just vibrating very still in place. Now let's take a look at our room temperature popsicle. These particles are moving a lot faster. They're more fluid and starting to flow better. And that is what gives us our liquid. So we can look at our little diagram here to compare and contrast the particle movement of a cold object and a warmer object. And how do you think a gas would look? What are those particles gonna look like? And our next thing I wanna talk about since we just demonstrated it is how heat can be transferred. So our first and easiest way is conduction. Conduction is just heat transferred by touching. So for example, I am touching this, and it's really cold actually, I am touching this cold um, popsicle. My body heat through conduction, I am transferring my body heat uh, to this cold popsicle. So again, heat moves from warmer objects to cooler objects. So my body heat, some of it is being transferred over to the popsicle and eventually it will start to melt. So that's conduction. The same example was demonstrated when I was touching uh, the hand boiler. So my body, my warmer body heat is being transferred to the cooler uh, liquid temperature. So that's conduction. It's just the method of heat transfer between two objects that are touching. Uh, your common example at home would be, for example, a hot pan touching the coils on a stove top, or when you're at home and you're ironing your clothes, that hot iron coming in contact with your clothes. So that's conduction. We have another method of heat transfer, and that is convection. So y'all are familiar with convection. If you've ever seen a lava lamp before, there's a bulb inside. That bulb is transferring electrical energy, since it's plugged into an outlet, to heat energy. That heat energy is heating up the liquid and the material inside. Typically, when things get hot, they will start to rise because they become less dense. Then once they're at the top, it's further from the heat source, so it's going to cool. When things cool, they become more dense and they start to sink. And that is why we see the constant movement within a lava lamp. I'm going to show you another example of a lava lamp, but this time I'm going to put on some uh, safety mitts because this lava lamp gets a lot hotter. And this one shows it a lot better. So you can see this blob over here is at the top. It's already cooling off because it's been further from the heat source, so it's going to start to sink. Now that blob already made its way up. So that lets us know that it just got heated at the bottom. So in general, things that are hot will rise. When they cool down, they will sink. And that whole cycle starts over again. Now this is an important concept because scientists actually study convection because it relates to hurricane formations. So when hot liquids or hot gases uh, get heated up, they rise because they are less dense. And then when they cool down, they sink because they are more dense. And that is convection. The next type of heat transfer that we're going to talk about is radiation. And that's just transfer of heat without matter to carry it. So for example, um, it's mostly like our electromagnetic waves. So think about our sun. Oops, I just broke that one. <laughs> so this is an example of a, a solar oven. We use this during the summertime uh, to actually cook s'mores and other foods using the sun's heat energy. So we can put whatever we're cooking on the inside and the reflective material intensifies uh, the heat from our sun and we can cook many different things. Another example of radiative heat transfer is very common out here. We use a lot of heat lamps for our reptile pets. So here's our terrarium. 
Um, this is a reptile that I borrowed from a co-worker. His name is Spike. And I'm going to pull him out and talk to you guys a little bit about him, and then we'll explain how he depends on our heat lamp or radiative heat from that heat lamp. Now, Spike here is a cold-blooded reptile. So cold-blooded animals are simply animals that cannot maintain their body temperature. So essentially, whatever degree it is outside or whatever degree it is in my room, that's going to be their body temperature. So if he's feeling cold, he's going to have to find an actual heat source. Um, and that's why they have heat lamps. So if he's getting cold, he's going to migrate over to the heat lamp and bask to stay warm. Once he feels warm enough, he can always move to the other side and cool off. Uh, so a lot of our snakes, uh, turtles, lizards, those are all reptiles. Now, luckily for humans, we are warm-blooded, so our body does a pretty good job of maintaining a constant body temperature. But this heat lamp is an example of heat transfer through radiation because if I stick my hand underneath the heat lamp, I can feel the heat, but I'm not actually touching the heat lamp. Now, if I were to touch the heat lamp, that would be conductive uh, heat transfer because I'm it's touching. But just putting my hand underneath, that's radiative. So I can hear, feel the heat radiating from the heat lamp. It's the same concept if you've ever sat by a campfire, you're not actually touching the fire, but you can feel that heat radiating uh, from the campfire itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and put Spike up. He did a pretty good job today. And then um, the last thing we're gonna do, I just have a little reflection question. Think about how you used heat energy and also thermal energy today. And then my challenge question, I found this cool little thing online this is a candle spinner. So my question for you guys is what example of energy is evident in this spinning candle? So I have a candle and then it has a spinner on top. So think about what is causing this uh, top to spin and why. So think about what's going on uh, to make this item work. Um, and that's all I have for you guys today for thermal energy. We're going to pass it back to Mr. Broughton and he's going to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mears. The uh, question that came in was, um, besides conduction, convection, and radiation, are there other ways that heat move? And I don't believe there are. There, those, it's just those three. Um, but I'm going to show you a, a quick little demonstration of conduction. So here I have a little step stool. This part of the step stool is metal. This part is rubber. And if I touch these, and this stool's just been sitting here in my uh, office all day long, so it's the temperature of my office. This feels cool. This feels a little bit warmer. So you might think, well, is this colder than this? And it's actually not. They're the same temperature. It's just that metal is a good conductor. It's, it's pulling the heat right out of my hand. Rubber is not a good conductor. It's a good insulator. So it's leaving the heat in my hand, but it makes it feel warmer to you. So you can try that sometime. Um, and he, hopefully you even have a thermometer to measure the temperature of those two different objects and see that they're actually the same temperature. A lot of kids think uh, they're a different temperature because they feel different. All right, now let's move on to uh, light and sound energy with Ms. Nash. Hello, welcome to my classroom. Today we're going to be talking about light and sound. So sound is energy we can hear, and light is energy we see. So the, the light from our sun is white light. All the colors of our rainbow, when the, the light shines through the water in the, in the foggy the after a rain, you see that rainbow just broke the color apart, and the white light into different colors. You can also be able to prove them. You can also try a bubble, and when we blow, blow your bubble, you can see all kinds of different colors in it because the water in the bubble is breaking the, the white light into its different colors. Now sound is vibration that we can hear. And if I drum, when I hit the drum, it vibrates the skin and I, we hear it. Inside your ear is another tiny drum that vibrates when air Sound waves hit from the air. Sound will also travel through water and solids like the earth, even better than to the air, actually. Now, when that light hits our eyes, it goes through a lens in our eye. And light can be bent. 
your burger and partner can also be big. So we might actually think that what we what we see and what we hear is all there is, but we would be wrong. Actually, there are many sounds we can't hear, and there are many like things we can't see, either invisible to us or inaudible to us. Sound too low to hear or too high to hear. But other animals are, about, are able to see and hear things that we can. For instance, our friend the owl has super hearing and super vision. So they can have ears under their feathers here, the eye, the disc around the eye funnels the sound to the ears. They can hear a mouse under the snow. They can see in the dark much better than we can. Their eyes are huge okay? and lots more light. But what light there is will go into their eye. In fact, that's why they can't, they can't move their eyes anymore. They have to turn their head. The eyes got so big, there's no room for muscles in there anymore. So there's lots of other interesting animals we're going to look at right now and think about how they use their superpowers of vision and hearing to survive. And then, 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 so that little piece in there is what we see, that rainbow. So from red up to violet. So we can remember Richard of York gave battle in vain. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. That's the colors we can see. But there are colors below that and above that, in the infrared and the ultraviolet, that other animals can see. Famously, the pit vipers have that pit. See that little hole there between the eye and the nose? That enables this animal to detect infrared. And they can hunt warm-blooded animals like birds and mammals. That tiger mosquito can do the same thing and hone in on warm-blooded dinner like your arm. Interestingly, a goldfish, a member of the carp family, that simply lives in kind of muddy water, that's that same ability. So I can kind of see things through the muddy water in the infrared. And the bullfrog can do the same thing. So I'm not quite sure why, maybe to avoid predators by becoming after them. Then, in, then we can see that rainbow that we talked about, that what we call the visible light. Okay. But then above that, we have well, we have really good color vision and good acuity. That means you can see detail. So other animals that have good color vision, not all do, but primates like the monkeys and the apes have really good color vision, just like us. So we can tell when fruit is ripe to eat, when it's ready to eat. So this, this um, spider monkey has found some nice ripe fruit. So you can tell it's time to have dinner. And birds also have good color vision. So this little hummingbird found the red flowers that mean there's lots of good nectar in there for the hummingbird. Now, insects are really interesting because they can see ultraviolet. So the wings of the butterflies have things on them that we can't see, but other butterflies can. Bees can't see the color red, but they can see in the ultraviolet range. And Flowers often have markings on them that tell the bees, hey, come on down, here's dinner. So this flower would be just all yellow to us, but to the bee, it has that blue ring around it that says, here's the nectar. Really amazing. Another animal you can see in that ultraviolet range are the caribou, or the reindeer, and they see the lichen. That's what they eat is lichen. Rodents and other animals, urine apparently, shows up in, in the ultraviolet range. So they can follow trails of other little rodents, and also their little urine trail will alert their predators, the birds like the hawk, that can also see that ultraviolet. And then they can swoop down and find their dinner. Now, as far as sound goes, again, we have a certain range, what we can hear. 
there sounds lower than we can hear and lots of sounds higher, infrasound and ultrasound. So in the low range, we have the elephant. So elephants can hear things through the ground. The sound is carried for miles and miles through the ground right? and they can hear it. So those great giant ears help them, I'm sure, besides keeping them cool. Another one that can hear those low, low infrasounds in the ground is a mole. So they've got their tiny eyes here that live underground and they can hardly see, but they can apparently hear and they can find dinner. And here we are again with our kind of mid-range hearing. And then other animals that can hear higher sounds and also softer sounds that we can't hear are things like our friend the fox. Here's one with really giant ears of fennec. It's a tiny, tiny fox. But look at those ears. They hunt mostly insects. So they listen for the rustle of a cricket in the ground. The bobcat has good ears too. They can move those ears around to catch, help catch sounds. And here's another cat with huge ears called a serval of Africa. And they're hunting little rodents in the grass. And they're using those big ears to hear a tiny rustling sound in the grass and find their den. And then of course the super ear, super ears are the bats. So they use what we call sonar. So they make out they, they make tiny high pitched sounds that bounce off insects and then back to those giant ears and they can catch their food. Another animal uses sonar in the water are the dolphins. So again they make really high pitched sounds we can't hear them. And, but they bounce back to the dolphin from the fish they're hunting and they can catch their dinner too. And then the big humpback here can sing through the water and other humpback whales hundreds of miles away can hear that sound that goes through the water really, really well. So lots of really interesting things that animals can do that maybe we can't. Okay, so there's lots of interesting things to find out about how animals can hear, and we might think about how they use color to warn other animals that I might be, this might be dangerous. Yeah. Don't eat me, I'm, I'm toxic, so all kinds of to say, here I am, look at me, I'm so perfect, be my friend. So animals use their abilities in different ways to read it, and sometimes the same. So I'd like you to pick an animal and then investigate both its vision and hearing and see what you can discover. And the insects in particular are really, really interesting. So thank you, and I hope you enjoyed yourself and learned something new and have more to discover. I'm going to send it back to Mr. Broughton for questions. Thank you, Ms. Nash. And the question that came up was, um, can we see things outside of the visible spectrum of color? And the answer is not with just our eyes. Uh, let me share my screen here. So if, remember, go back to I found a picture a lot like with Ms., what Ms. Nash showed. We can see this visible range of light, um, which is right here on the um, electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, now, a telescope will allow us to see visible light that's so far away we can't see it with just our eyes. And then we've also invented or are in the process of, an, of building a new telescope called the James Webb Telescope. And um, let's find a picture of it. There it is. Uh, when it's all unfolded, because when they first fly out to space, it'll be folded up. But when it unfolds, it'll be about the size of a tennis court. And it's going to be able to see infrared light. So that's, uh, oops, I clicked the wrong thing there. Um, this part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So it'll be able to go from here all the way to here. And it will help us see a lot of things that we have not been able to see um, yet. All right, now let's move on to electric circuits with Mr. Uh, Monroe. Okay, good afternoon students. My name is Mr. Monroe and my part of your virtual field trip with us today 
is that we're going to be looking at and talking about how a closed circuit can produce uh, heat and light and even sound. So when we talk about a circuit, we're talking about the flow of electricity and uh, the type of circuit that we're working with today is called a closed or complete circuit. I have constructed a couple of those circuits so that I can demonstrate that for you. Now, <clears throat> in constructing that, those circuit boards, I used some materials and I had to make sure that the wiring that I used was a type of wiring, a type of metal, that would be a conductor. And one of the most common conductor uh, metals that we use today for conduction is a metal called copper, okay? Copper is found in your houses, it's found in buildings, because it is an excellent conductor of electricity. The electrical source that we're going to be using, along with this copper wire, is a D-cell battery. And the amount of electricity that this D-cell battery has, and electricity is measured in volts, it's 1.5 volts. Now, that's a little bitty tiny amount compared to the amount of volts that may be running through the wiring in your house. Most of the time, common wiring has a voltage of 110 volts, can go as high as 220, 240, depending on the type of uh, machines that it's going to be working. Also, we're going to be using a tiny, tiny light bulb, which I'm hoping that you all will be able to see the light if we can get it to come on, because it won't be so bright. Now, talking about circuits, the circuits that I have constructed basically are what we call complete circuits. And uh, I'm going to start out by showing you this one on the board. This is a complete or a closed circuit. Now, what we have here is the flow of electrical energy. Now, that flow, we refer to that as current, the electrical current. And what we have here basically is a direct current up until we have a separation here that is caused by a switch. Now this type of switch is called a knife switch. This is the light bulb. This is the energy source, which is the D cell battery. What I'm going to do, I'm going to close the switch and we'll see if this construction of a circuit board is successful. we do have light. So we do have a current that is flowing, following these arrows that you see, it's flowing around. It is a closed circuit or a complete circuit. Now, what happens if I open the switch? The circuit is broken. Now, it's open circuit. Or sometimes we refer to it as being short circuited, all right? Same thing will happen if I disconnect one of the connects off of the battery. Because remember, it has to be a continuous flow of the electrical current. Even if this light bulb should burn out. Now students, what I mean by the light bulb burning out, the light bulb, and I wish I had a larger clear one to show you, but the light bulb is basically constructed this way where the electrical charges are passing up through the base of it. And inside the internal part, there's two prongs coming up from the base. Now, connecting the two prongs, there's a little thin piece of wire called the filament. And it's made out of a substance called tungsten. When the electrical current passes through that, it heats that filament up. And that filament, because of what it's made of, gives this tremendous glow. And then what really helps it light up is that the bulb is actually has an inert gas that's sealed inside of that bulb that gives off a brighter glow, okay? Now, once that filament gets so hot over time, it will maybe separate or burn in half, which is going to break the contact, and guess what? It acts just like a switch. It will not light anymore. It's shutting it down. Now, of course, in your house, your electrical lights, that energy, that electricity is much more stronger 
than this 1.5 volts that I've just showed you. On the other hand, we can use a closed circuit to also produce sound. This circuit was constructed much like the one that has the light bulb on it. I have the D-cell battery. I have the knife switch. And then I have a device that makes a sound once the electrical charge passes through it, just like the light bulb lit up when the current passed through it. So let's see if we can get a little sound, all right? You guys hear that? We do have sound. It's not a very big sound, but we are creating sound with this closed circuit or complete circuit. Same thing, if I disconnect one of these, let me open that up again. If I disconnect that, it's just like a switch, okay? Now, there are several different types of circuits. Of course, what we just observed, what we just looked at, and what I was talking about is the complete circuit. We have also what we call a series circuit, where there might be several light bulbs in the flow, maybe located, a second light bulb would be somewhere in here, okay? Now, the crazy thing about a series circuit is that if that light bulb, one of the light bulbs burns out, guess what happens? The other light bulb is not going to light either. And that used to drive, drive me crazy around the holidays years ago because you know what? The Christmas lights that we used to put up on our houses some time ago, they were basically constructed like a serious circuit. So if one of those light bulbs burn out, the rest of them in that string of lights, they wouldn't work. And it used to drive me crazy trying to find out which one of those Christmas lights had burned out. On the other hand, a parallel series, a parallel circuit, it has several pathways for the current to keep going, keep going, at least two in this diagram. If this light bulb should burn out right here, the electrical current can still travel through that upper light bulb. Or if this would burn out, the electrical currents could still travel through the lower light bulb. So there you have it. Now, looking at this poster here, it says, are these lights on a series or parallel circuit? Well, we can see this light bulb is lit right here. This one's lit. This one's lit. That one's out. But the one behind it, guess what? It's lit. So this is an example of a parallel circuit. Now, as far as sound, sometimes we have external speakers increasing the sound. And you would need more electricity to... Uh, enhance that a little bit so most likely you would have to plug this into a plug to get some additional electricity as far as other products or other things that could be used i have a old pump coming from one of my aquariums in the back of this lab and it's a very powerful pump because it has an electric motor so electricity can also with the circuit can be used to run an electric motor. And I'm going to plug that up just for a minute. And we can hear that motor going now. I'm not going to run that very long because it doesn't have any water and I don't want to burn the pump up, burn the motor up. All right. So, students, listen. Hopefully, I've given you an idea about how electrical current passes through a closed circuit that can give us light, give us sound, even uh, increase the sound, and then give us heat. Because when that light bulb lit up, if this light bulb was a little bit bigger, guess what? We would have felt how warm it would get. Now, this also is run by electricity. It's called a hot plate. Now, this one would run off a regular plug, and once you got it started, it could heat up a small container of water to the boiling point of water, 212 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And so it can be used to, to produce heat. So students, again, hopefully you've got a little understanding about a closed circuit and how it can be used to produce light, sound, 
and heat. Now, if you have any questions, I'm going to give it back to Mr. Um, Rotten, and hopefully he can answer those questions for you. I want you guys to have a good day the rest of the day. All right, Mr. Broughton. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Uh, the question that came in is how much uh, more powerful is the electricity in my house than a D-cell battery? And uh, a D-cell battery is 1.5 volts. The electricity coming out of the outlet in your house is 120 volts. So it's quite a bit stronger. You definitely have to be careful with that uh, kind of electricity. Even a 1.5 volt battery, you need to be uh, careful. They can get hot. A uh, car battery is about 12 volts, If just in case you're wondering about that. All right, let's do a quick recap of what we did today. So I'm going to share my screen one last time. And uh, today we explored forms of energy. During this virtual field trip, we discovered that energy occurs in many forms and can be observed in cycles, patterns, and systems. Students also explored the uses of energy and observed that the flow of electricity in closed circuits can produce light, heat, or sound. So we started off with that exploration of mechanical energy with Mrs. Fuller. Next, we explored thermal energy with Mr. Mirez. Then we explored light and sound energy with Ms. Nash. And last, we explored electric circuits with Mr. Monroe. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We hope you enjoyed uh, learning about forms of energy as much as we did. Uh, we would like to know what you think about today's field trip, and you can let us know by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback and filling out a short feedback form to let us know how we did. We use your comments and suggestions to improve what we do here. And uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the day, and I hope to see you again in about three weeks. Have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.